So, uh, hi, my name is Rasmus Samberg. I'm currently a data engineer working in Stockholm at a company called Stadium. We do sport retailing, but I'm also a former research assistant here at Linköping University, where I worked with Niklas and Patrick, specifically in the field of hockey analytics, looking at the different projects in the field of ice hockey and how we can analyze it. So the topic of today is the importance of special teams in ice hockey. Um, there we go. So the motivation behind this is that we wanted to have some sort of quantitative notion of how important special teams can be. How much does a good power play, for instance, impact the team's success? How much does a bad box play or penalty kill affect your chance of winning a game and so on? And these two, power play and box play or penalty kill, are commonly perceived to be quite important in like seeing how successful the team will be. It can be typically attributed to winning a game or not winning the game if you have a power play goal, for instance. But it is not typically studied how exactly important this is. So that is what we wanted to approach and find some way to quantify this. And another motivation why we want to, why this is interesting for various reasons is the fact that in certain uh, organizations and teams, the specialization in special teams can start very early in ages. For instance, consider a team of say 10 year olds, should they start specializing explicitly in power play? For instance, only playing the best players or should there be some more rotation in the, uh, well, rotation of players so that everybody gets a chance to do so. And what we hope to sort of answer question wise is if there is some sort of relationship between the quality of special teams and team success, as well as, sorry to say, how important different manpower situations is for both winning a game and overall taking game points, which will be measured on the season level. So the data that we have used is from the NHL between 2010, starting from the 2010-11 season up until 2021 season. So this is only the play-by-play -play data. So in uh, in contradiction to David's paper, we don't have passes, for instance, in our data. But the main thing we're analyzing here is the goals. And as most of you are aware, there are three seasons in here which were shortened. The first due to a lockout and the two later ones due to the COVID-19 virus. As well, we only consider regulation time in this study. So no overtime or penalty shootouts. Starting off with some descriptive statistics to give you a little bit of an overview of how it looks for the data that we have analyzed. We start by looking at goal scoring and manpower opportunities. What we have on the y-axis here is basically a proportion. So the highest bar will be one or very close to one because they are the highest, uh, well, highest bar of goals. So in order to have scored a goal when the goal differential is one, you of course have to score a goal when the goal differential is zero. Otherwise you can't get the last day. So what we see here in the upper graph is that we have a most goals being scored when there is no manpower difference. So your equal number of players and guys, followed by a manpower differential of one, which would be equated to a power play. Then we have some goals for each while playing with one player less and few with lacking or like having two more players or two fewer players. When it comes to goal differential, again, most goals are scored when the goal differential is zero and followed by the goal differential one, minus one, and then two and minus two. Here we can also note that it is more common from the data that we've analyzed to score again, when you have a lead, as opposed to tying the game. 
when it comes to the duration of each manpower situation, it is overwhelmingly in uneven strength, particularly playing five on five. And the other situations, such as pulling the goalie, having six versus five, or having a power play, is not as common. It only occurs in 15 to 20% of the game. And we can also note that having a two-man advantage is very rare because the stars have to align and you have to get a little bit lucky. Moving on to goals scored versus the number of penalties. To break this down, we have, in this bar for instance, you can have one or two penalties during a game and we measure how many of those, basically if there was a goal in either of those penalties. So you need to score at least one goal in order to have show up here. And what we see is roughly that 25% of cases, if you have one or two power play opportunities, is that you will score a goal. And this continues to increase the more penalties you get. So in order to have at least a 50% probability of scoring at least one goal, you need basically four penalties. And if you have way more, you will most likely score more goals as well. When it comes to shorthanded goals, they're not exceedingly rare. Like, it's in common, sorry. So, they're not expected to be scored in the same rate. Also to mention here is that double minors and major penalties are scoreless fairly often, with the caveat that scoreless in this situation means that from the start of the penalty until it ends, either by, for instance, game end, a goal was scored or something, or another penalty occurs, that is what we define for scoreless. So if you have a major penalty, which is offset by your team getting a penalty, the competition here will be scoreless. And tying in a little bit to what Niklas just spoke about, we also looked at the importance of an individual goal which we used the GPIV metric. And just a brief overview of GPIV, again, a little bit of repetition from Niklas, is that we have the following formula. So we have a context before the goal, BG, and a context after the goal, AG. And we look at how the probability of winning and tying the game is impacted by the goal itself. So, the change in probability of winning the game by scoring a goal, as well as the change in probability, here we specified of regulation ending in a tie, but it's equivalent to an overtime loss, of course. And moving on to the analysis itself of this GPIV in the context of special teams, here we can see that we have different sets of goal differential. So in particular, D1 with minus one, which is where you're trailing by one. We can see that as time progresses along the x-axis sphere for a minute, we see that the goal importance continues to increase, reaching almost 1.5. And for the other goal differentials, this is not nearly as important. But the main takeaway here is that there's three different lines in each subgraph and they all more or less have the same shape. They don't differ that much if a goal is scored when you're on the power play or if you're playing even strength, for instance. So what we can see is there is a similar importance for goals regardless of the manpower difference. Moving on a little bit more to the quanti quantifying this importance, we have used a method with which consisted of a series of generalized additive models. I'm not going to dive into the theoretical aspects of it, but instead of just using a drawing like a simple line, which is, would be linear regression or something along those lines, we have used an additive model, which allows you to basically draw whatever shape you want, which adds some extra flexibility. Our outcome in this analysis would be the points accrued at the end of the season. There's an asterisk, which is there because 
as I mentioned before, some seasons were shortened. So for those seasons, we have basically extended the season artificially. So if you had a set amount of points after 48 games, then you will be journalized that point to the equ yeah. equivalent of 82 games to make everybody have a fair playing field. We fit a series of models, which means we have many of them, and each of them have a different set of variables, which include information over the goal difference. More on that on the next slide. And the models themselves, we were training on 2010 until 2011, and keeping the last season as so, sort of as a whole dot evaluation data set to see how well it generalizes to unseen data. So the variables were basically in two different categories. You have the goal differential on the left, which basically means if you have five goals for one team and three for the other, it would be five minus three is equal to two. While the other one uses the interaction of goals for the team and against the team. So instead of having two, you would have five and three respectively and they interact with each other. We broke this down into five different cases. The first one is only considering shorthanded success, power play success, shorthanded and power play success, even strength, and finally, everything all in one. So what did we find out? Well, looking at the results, we have two bars for each model. The underscore CP is based on an interaction. So that's uses both goals for and goals against. While the non pattern bar is basically only the goal differential. What we can see is that shorthanded success only is not super important for explaining the deviance here, which in short terms, Deviance is basically how far is the model that we have done from the perfect model. And the deviance explained will then be a ratio of how close are we to the perfect model. So a value of one when it comes to deviance explained is perfect according to the definition and a value close to zero is not very good. So for shorthanded, we have slightly below 20% of this explained, which means it's not very good. The same for power play, rising just above 20. Combining them two will reach us about 40%, which is a little bit of an improvement. But if we only look at even strength, which as I've shown before, is the majority of the game, we can see that this is the single manpower situation that is most important for team success. And if we include everything, we can improve upon this slightly. So the inclusion of special teams to even strength raises us a little bit, but not a lot. And we also see a slight increase when we're considering the interaction between goals for and goals against, which could be attributed to the fact that we have more information. Instead of having one value, we have two values. Next, we look at the scoring rate, and we here divided teams into different groups based on how many points they would have at the end of an 82 game season. So the small box on top specifies the point intervals, the N specifies the number of teams, and the numbers here specify if you were above average, for instance, in even strength, and below average in power play, power play scoring. So what does this tell us? Well, looking at this, we can see that, for instance, the worst teams, historically, are below average in power play, power play scoring and even strength scoring. Perhaps not very surprising. They are at the bottom of the league. Similarly, at the best teams in the league, they are both typically above average in power play and even strength scoring. Again, not very surprising. But what we can see is the fact that if you're below average in even strength, you're more likely to be on the left side here than you are on the other side. 
which is where you typically want to be. You want to be one of the best teams in the league, hopefully. So just having an average, above average power play does not necessarily guarantee that you will be successful at the end of the season. Because we see cases where, for instance, among the worst teams from the last 10 or so 11 seasons, there are 16% of teams which are above average in power play, but below average in even strength. Keeping on the same trend of teams, there's a lot of information on this, but it's every team's expected goals scored, which I would like to clarify is not the actual expected goals, which we compute by using different models. It's rather the expected scoring rate per game, more or less. So for instance, if we look at the most simple one, which is Seattle, they're expected in the 2021-22 season to score slightly above two goals per game while in even strength. And not a lot in either power play or shorthanded. So what we can see, for instance, is how the teams have changed over time when it comes to their scoring rate. Hopefully this allows, for instance, analysts of teams to see how different seasons have treated their team. For instance, some teams have a drastic dip, such as Arizona's power play in the last season we analyzed. And there's also some certain big jumps up, which could be attributed to a higher offensive production, of course. Yes. And then a little bit of a conclusion and then tying to some future work. We have found here in our analysis that goal scored in even strength and power play, if you want to count shorthanded here as well, have similar importance when scored under similar circumstances. That is, they have the same goal difference and they have the same time, more or less. However, we found that even strength is a larger contributor to team success, mainly or, well, mainly because it's so much more time played in even strength than in power play. But there are, of course, other factors that play in here as well. And the last point is tied into the scoring rate graph I showed you earlier in that having a strong special teams, for instance, power play scoring, does not necessarily fix if you're really bad on even strength, because most of the game is played in even strength. So hopefully you should be somewhat quality, have some ha somewhat high quality in those situations. Before I end, I would like to highlight some limitations and maybe something about future work, which would be that for instance, here we've looked mostly at goals in attributing to team success. There are, of course, other variables to consider. You can also break it down even more. Treat, for instance, when you pull the goalie as a very specific, different scenario and have that account for any model as well. And for future work, we hope this has provided a somewhat of a basis for how you can quantify how important special teams is for team success. And that's all I had. Yeah. Questions? So I have one, can, can you show, there was a slide early on, I think you showed like, the, the number of games where goals were scored, just, yeah, this one. Yes. So manpower differential. Mm -hmm. So I understand that this is, so to read the top graph, so yes. uh, at, a, at a plus one differential, 65-ish uh, percent of the games had goals scored in that situation, is that? Yes, okay. so when you have a power play, yeah. you score, well, in 65% of games, there was a goal scored. Got it. And so did you consider doing this? To me, it seemed like, I'm curious what this looks like, even percentage of time played at even strength or at, did you, 
considered that or produced graphs that look like that? I believe we considered it, but we did not take it a step further to produce graphs. Because like you said, most of the time is spent, because when I looked at this, it's like, yeah. okay, so if most of the time is spent at even strength, yeah. then there's a lot of goals scored when you, so the proportion of goals scored on, on power plays is high. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yes. Thanks for the talk. Um, if you go to the slide with all the teams on it, yes. did you do a dive into any of these teams? Because uh, like Florida and Minnesota seem to um, at least be increasing year over year. So did you look into any of that, even while they're like power play and shorthanded seem pretty consistent? Unfortunately, we didn't have the time to deep dive into a specific team, but that is also something you can consider in the model, for instance, the team to have some more nuance in that different teams play differently. But uh, we didn't do any deeper analysis of the teams. Thanks. Do you have uh, data on Edmonton this year? Not currently, no, but I would expect that their power play would shoot up compared to everything else. What I can say, however, though, is there is an overall trend starting from the 2016-2017 season where the average goals per game jumps from about 2.7 until almost 3, which then is true for the remainder of the seasons after it. One last thing. Um, if you go back a few slides, I think the uh, where you had the share of the game played at uh, each manpower. Is it, did you look at the number of penalties called from year to year? Because it seems as though, like, if I'm understanding this plot, that fewer penalties are being called, or at least that would be my intuition, because there's more five on five play. Or they could be scoring quicker. Or, yeah, that's a good, good point, too. So, yeah, did, I guess, did you, uh, did you calculate this based on, seconds on the power play or was it like two minutes of the game we when it comes to the power play and how long you played we considered the seconds from when it started to when it ended either by scoring a goal an offsetting penalty or like the game ended so i think it's a mixture because i've seen in general that power play has been become much better in recent seasons and there are a few edge cases like boston had one game where they scored one power play goal in one second of power play. That's all they had. Because the player basically exits the penalty booth just as Boston score. So some situations like that also occur. Um, you just mentioned that <clears throat> you saw um, from 16 to 17, there was an increase in goals. And you also mentioned that um, power play percentage has kind of gone up in recent years. Did you do yeah. any like, um, analysis of like a subset and maybe from like this a specific year onward or like a specific few year time period where you saw a difference in the importance of power plays? Unfortunately not. We would, however, recommend this for a future study because as we have seen, there is some change with each season. And this becomes very particular in the scoring rate from the season on, as you mentioned as well. But in our model, we do not account for it, but it would, however, we believe be a good factor to contribute for future studies. Yes. I'm curious if you considered breaking up the playoffs separately. We haven't considered them, but we imagine that would be a very interesting uh, contrast to the regular season. Yeah. Because we imagine they would be quite different in certain aspects. I guess as a comment there, it seems like, at least for the first few rounds this year, the team that were better five on five typically advanced. So it seems like power play played a smaller, smaller factor. I also wonder, in the playoffs, it feels like there are fewer penalties called. I mean, in the NHL, in, in, I don't know if that's actually true, but it seems like it, and I wonder if that's maybe a factor as well. Like, do you have to consider that big factor in normalizing with respect to the number of power players? 
No, and I, th I think another factor is sort of the, I mean, you can have more penalties, but if the referees are scared of uh, sort of impacting too much, there might be offsetting penalties yeah, more yeah. frequently. So, yeah. But but no, we, we didn't look into that. Hmm? Right. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yes.